Hello and welcome back to International School History Teacher. Uh, this is the penultimate in a series of six lessons dedicated to the fundamental issues surrounding the question, the key question, of what is history. Now in these last three lessons I've been perhaps a little bit harsh on poor old history. I've relied somewhat heavily on the, the postmodern critique of the last 30 years um, of people like Hayden White and popularised by people like Keith Jenkins. Um, Postmodernism was a, an intellectual movement that influenced most academic disciplines, but in history, it was particularly important, as we saw in the last lesson, in uh, the view that language is not simply a reflection of reality. Now, for some historians, like Geoffrey Elton, who we've got here, this postmodern threat, this contention that history is um, really about creating meaning as much as uncovering meaning, um, is perhaps the most dangerous threat that has ever been for the subject. And, I, and I'll quote Elton on this when he says, in battling against people who would subject historical studies to the dictates of literary critics, we historians are, in a way, fighting for our lives. Certainly, we are fighting for the lives of innocent young people beset by devilish tempters who claim to offer higher forms of thought and deeper truths and insights, uh, the intellectual equivalent of crack. Well, if you did enjoy the last three lessons, there's a good reason for it. It was apparently the intellectual equivalent of crack cocaine. Anyway, in these last two lessons, I plan to make Ben Elton's uncle happy and put my devilish tempting aside. Although it's kind of ironic that most British school children probably get most of their memorable historical knowledge uh, from Ben Elton rather than from Sir Geoffrey Elton. Man's a bicycle. <laughs> I heard that it started when a bloke called Archie Duke shot an ostrich because he was hungry. I think you mean it started when the Archduke of Austro-Hungary got shot. <laughs> no, there was definitely an ostrich involved. So. Anyway, today we're going to talk about why history, good old-fashioned archive and fact history, is vitally important. <laughs> All this stuff I produce, or people like me, produce the raw material for them. Except the people who put up this statue, and all the others, they're not interested in history. They're interested in stories, in myths, in fairy tales, in mutually incompatible fairy tales. They change, they swap around. So stories, myths, and fairy tales. The past can be used to make patriotic stories, nationalist statues, as we saw in that film extract, and even bomb-making factories. The past is routinely used and abused. Now, history is the most powerful weapon we have in the battle against this abuse of the past. And as Hobsbawm suggests, historians have a duty to identify and act to counter the abuse of the past. The goal of the good historian is to find out and explain what really happened in the past. But not everybody who uses the past uses it with such a noble ambition. What makes historians special, and special users of the past, is that they are alone concerned with making sense of the past simply for making sense of the past. History is the study of the past for itself. David Lowenthal makes a really useful distinction in this respect, in that if the user of the past is using the past for present-day purposes, whatever those present-day purposes might be, whether positive, uh, benign or indeed harmful, then what they're doing is not history, but rather what he calls heritage. 
Heritage is not history at all. While it borrows from and enlivens historical study, heritage is not an inquiry into the past, but a celebration of it. Not an effort to know what actually happened, but a profession of faith in a past tailored to present day purposes. The past is always knocking. Never has the past been so present in our lives than it is today. Through heritage, the past is absolutely everywhere, on dedicated television channels and a thousand Hollywood movies and Netflix series in folkloric celebrations and, and glossy magazines, best-selling novels and nostalgic commercial adverts. You can't drive down a European motorway without a brown sign crying out to you, come and get your heritage fix here. Well, if you want to get some of his Heritage is everywhere. The question is why? I think it's because we live in a time of unprecedented change and resulting uncertainty. Traditional identities of, uh, of gender, of family, of, of nationhood have shifted and are continuing to shift. And political instability, the threat of ecological catastrophe provide an existential crisis in which the past, through heritage, provides a sort of soothing balm. In the words of the poet, nostalgia is the opium of the age. Heritage's nostalgia provides stability and coherence, a certain, a certain certainty of the good old days. In a time of unprecedented social, economic and cultural change, this is important. The reassuring thing about the past is that we know what happens next. It makes sense in a way that the present never can. And history is different to heritage. Good history is essential if we are to continue to know the difference between them, because heritage may borrow from history. It even looks like history sometimes. It can be produced by historians. But heritage has a common, non-historical, present-orientated purpose. Heritage uses the past to entertain, to inspire, to engage, to provide identity, to sell us Levi 501s, in the here and now, that's what makes heritage importantly different. As a history student, one of the most obvious examples of the, of the power and importance of heritage is to be found in the very textbooks that we use to study our subject. In most countries, the school history curriculum and the textbooks um, that are written are written in a way that it has to be approved by the state. Um, they have to be officially sanctioned. Why is history such an important subject? It is compulsory until the end of formal education in most European countries. You can't ever drop history. Why is so much time, so much effort and money invested in teaching and testing children? on knowing their nation's past. If you're lucky enough to go to an international school, compare the national textbooks of the countries your friends come from, but also contrast them. What is different in the content and the emphasis? Why do some history books cover certain content and not others? What do they leave out and why do they leave out certain parts of history? School history can be extraordinarily controversial, and has even in the past led to diplomatic confrontation between nation states. All right, you got a brand new high school history textbook and stirring up a lot of controversy for being, get this, anti-Trump already. They also worried about the mental stability of the president-elect and the anger that he and his supporters brought to the nation. The leader of the ruling Henry Party voiced his party's concerns about the history textbooks. For the 2015 school year, the government introduced a new subject for the official nationwide curriculum, Fundamentals of Religious and Moral Culture of the Peoples of Russia. Nostalgia isn't what it was Farewell then 
The conservative members on the board felt that some terms used in the textbooks portray America in a negative light. You can see the changes to replace imperialism. So Don McElroy made an amendment to delete the word and replace it with expansionism. Thinking by presenting multiple sides of this issue. So they're saying it was peer reviewed, and, and, and obviously, all of the uh, people in academia, they were okay with it. <laughs> and critical is the key word. <laughs> The plan to have Korean middle and high schools use history textbooks authored by the state, as proposed by the previous administration, has been officially scrapped. Heritage is at its most dangerous when it acquires a popular political dimension, um, as it did in the 1930s, and which unfortunately is also acquired once again today. Popular nationalists. Um, get drawn to the past in order to tell sort of simplified stories about uh, past national glory that somehow people in the present like to claim some sort of credit for. It's only historians that stand in the way of those who would use the past as part of a patriotic agenda. Because it's historians, and only historians, who have the means and interests in exposing this sort of partiality and challenging the myths that so often constitute the national story. So, in conclusion, what we've seen in this lesson is that when the past is used for a present-day purpose, that purpose is not history. It is something we call heritage. Now, most heritage is harmless and can even be very useful. History teachers are part of the heritage industry. We use the past uh, to teach you how to critically analyse historical documents or to write well-organised and clearly structured essays or even, God forbid, to teach 21st century skills. But I'm not an historian. Anyway, in the final lesson, next lesson, we'll look at what makes real historians special and what makes history hard. Next time. Architecture,